Good morning. I'm glad to participate in this meeting. I believe that for all of us that have had a, a um, connection with Wikipedia and other knowledge and information sources, it is uh, highly significant to interact with those interested, with stakeholders, with participants, with producers of uh, this media. The title for my lecture is How Do We Know Today? I believe that this is a part of the part of the of what we need to think about. Those of us that were educated in literature or um, sciences, as published in books, have suffered. And uh, let me underscore the word "suffered," because it has been uh, with uh, an effort has been necessary to sit in front of new screens using new media, new, uh, m new means to communicate in different ways. And this is not only technical learning. It implies changing the way in which we know about things. And uh, this uh, assumes rethinking about all the processes implied in the in knowledge, how and uh, when can we differentiate what is false and what is true? How can we approach the truth if there is something we might call truth? Because uh, we should begin with the assumption that there is no, no such thing as the truth in capitals. However, there are levels of, um, of understanding of what's real that are more uh, accurate and more effective to behave and uh, to move uh, to move in society and in nature. All of this has uh, transformed with the emergence of uh, new technological devices, with the globalized communication means. There are different different scales of knowledge, but the notion itself of what uh, knowledge is, what does it mean? How can knowledge be reached? How can we know something has uh, has changed, has been changing? So I would like to begin with my first distinction, which I believe is essential. And that is when we ask ourselves, how can we, how, how do we obtain information? How do we know? How do we do research? A key difference is uh, between those that speak of um, soci information society or a knowledge society. The first uh, name, information society, designates a um, model of development in which uh, productive processes are restructured according to the key, uh, to the core role that IT and uh, telecom had in the production of goods and services. It implies an exponential increase in the capability of producing, storing, and then transmitting information, redu reducing production costs, increasing international competition, as well as liberating and deregulating its uh, circulation. From the past decade in the documents, of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and the European Commission. This uh, socio-technological remodeling has been conceived as the spring that has enabled the expansion of markets that has favored um, more widespread access to sources of knowledge, as well as um, higher political participation and a better quality of life. The core role that industrialization had as an engine of the first uh, modernization is now being taken by the information outlets. We have gone from the from the factory to the lab, from producing objects that even though continue to be produced, we have begun to the prevalence of information flows. Along these lines, it is uh, assumed that the most balanced social and cultural development 
depends on all countries integrating to a digital um, information revolution. All sectors in all societies have access to in smart uh, jobs and connect to a net networks through which information is obtained and communicated. If inequality is not produced by the um, ownership or lack of ownership of uh, means of production, but uh, because of, ac of the access to the new flows of information, the expansion of markets and their multinational integration will uh, mainstream economic benefits and those that have a more political vision and not only a technocratic vision have said that direct and simultaneous access to information will democratize education and will decentralize democratic decision making. Besides this uh, conceptual uh, concepts, uh, conceptual uh, ideas of this uh, changes and the dilemmas this uh, stand for. I would like to allude to empirical research that has documented what is happening in these fields regarding very specific uh, matters. The first uh, study I would like to allude to briefly is a set of studies that have been performed in the past few years, in the past decade regarding the delivery of uh, computers to students, students from uh, elementary or, uh, or junior high school students for them to take home. What has happened with this process, which has taken place in several countries? Well, I've recently had the opportunity to get to know the study that I believe is more uh, careful or is more qualitative uh, ethnographic survey about this process that took place in Uruguay. It was uh, carried out by two researchers, Rosalia Vinocur and Rosario Sanchez Vilela, with uh, the sponsorship of the Inter-American Development Bank. And uh, they, of course, worked on what was happening once computers were delivered at uh, schools, but they also went uh, and visited households because children could take the computers home and they followed up on the family and the community processes and um, found out what effects this transformation or this introduction of a new agent could have. Of course, they, obs they observed what uh, is m most well known, which is that when computers or tablets uh, arrive at schools, children feel a, a connection, are fascinated by these new objects they have heard about, and that for the most part, they have not had the opportunity of uh, having access to because they did not exist back at home. And the second observation that um, characterizes all these processes is that um, a loss of hierarchy in, in school relationships takes place. The teacher that had a now that had an that used to have an authority that used to be authoritarian feels uh, displaced by a new object that children can handle more easily which capabilities are more uh, easy to understand by children and that enables them uh, that enable them to transform information however computers and tablets often in many of these countries reach the home and this has occurred to put it to, to put but, but very few data in the U.S., which was the first country to generate computer infrastructure within schools, not for everybody at the beginning, but with a special room where people would check the computer. But ever since, 17 countries in Latin America have installed different types of digital infrastructure in the classroom. And many of these 17 countries, which include Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, etc., have adopted this proposal by Nicolas Negroponte and MIT 
one, of one computer per child and to try and make every kid responsible of their own computer and make them feel like that computer belongs to them. The Inter-American Bank of Development estimates that by 2015, the there might be about 43 million laptops or computers delivered to school children. The merit of these computers and tablets uh, one in, under this system of one laptop per child or one tablet per child must be evaluated through considering not only its capacity of impacting school and uh, work dynamics and learning dy dynamics at school, but also the community impact through different networks. It is not a minor issue because although most of these research are still in the experimental phase, we're starting to notice that despite what we had noticed or expected, a computer has a low impact on performance in subjects such as math and Spanish. So many have now doubted the efficacy of these programs because of their high cost. However, they warn or they say that children become more uh, familiar with the technology and it therefore serves as a type of training and provides them with better op better job opportunities for the for the child because many jobs now require that workers know how to use computers and other devices but the impact is much higher as far as we know and this research in Uruguay uh, states this in the family the computer is a strange device for the parents and for the older brothers and sisters who went to school and didn't have a computer. And it is given very diverse use, uses that transform the way in which they learn. For parents, for instance, knowledge was produced by researchers and then fed to them in the schools and it was then applied to work particularly local work in the communities in the cities in the country today we know that globalization now makes knowledge produced in every continent and under different scales interdependent and all these knowledges are coexisting and codependent and this comes into play with tablets and computers because it gives people who have low preparation the possibility of relating with these goods. So there's also in the family a de hierarchization. The, the parents have a hard time dealing with this new situation. And many countries, this happened in Uruguay, but central agencies have been created to, to with, with hotlines where you call and people help you and things like this happen let's say a mother is helping her kid with homework the kid has a problem with the computer the computer freezes they don't know what to do they call the phone number and they tell them okay please close the window and she gets up and she walks to the nearest window so, so there's this new vocabulary which has led to the creation of, of dictionaries even of how to reconsider traditional words under this new framework but there's also communities of fishermen in Uruguay 
who didn't know how they were going to, to what they were going to do the next day. They didn't know if they were going to have the right weather. They, they can now read a 14-day weather forecast and obtain other type of technical knowledge that can help their, them improve their livelihood. And this has changed the lives of many communities. This computer, which in Uruguay are called Ceibalitas, not only has an effect on the school and the family, it has a projection, it projects onto the community life. Therefore, it is a central laboratory experience with regards to the effect of a technology, a technological object, but also on the way that knowledge is reorganizing um, amongst the family, the school, and the community. Access to information has expanded. But we do not necessarily see an elimination of previous inequalities. What up until a few years ago we called the digital gap. Knowing how to use a digital device. Now we have, we see how other types of gaps, such as ethnic or social or income gaps have an effect on your capacity to access and use a computer and how these gaps often become obstacles and a source of difficulty. Let's see with a bit of more detail another research we conducted in Mexico City and Madrid with young creatives, young entrepreneurs, trendsetters or tech setters. These are young people who develop new types of creativity in their disciplines because they are writers, visual artists, video artists, multimedia performers, musicians, and this has changed their way of producing their cultural goods and accessing other cultural goods. The notion of consumption and creation has changed, and therefore we have new concepts such as prosumers, where you have the consumer and the producer in the same person. We're not no longer only consumers, people who take goods like a CD or a videotape. No, we download things from the internet which we can modify, like a DJ or a VJ who recreates and resends these materials through the internet so people can continue transforming them. This is fascinating because of the freedom it provides. We can watch a series on TV not only when the TV channel wants but because but also when we want. And this is one of the reasons why the new generation watches less and less TV. And for instance, a concert that took place at a certain time uh, in another country, another TV channel, well, that is uploaded to YouTube or some other site, and we can access it. So the, this modifies and changes the different habits of people, and it gives a huge amount of freedom to adults. And maybe sometimes we have to change our habits and start watching on small screens the things that we used to watch on large screens. 
things that both these and now we have access to products such as movies maybe that would never be shown in the local theaters or the local TV channels. But this freedom also exists in the possibility of creating and here I would have to, to make a brief parenthesis to say something that is not too evident. And for anthropologists, it's very important to consider. Some say that information society does not equal society of knowledge. One thing is to inform yourself, and another thing is to actually know, particularly in, play, in a society where different information can be contrasted and create a type of common knowledge, not only among advanced scientists. And this information differs from the information that has been provided to us. And for this reason, we need to differentiate a society of information from a society of knowledge. One thing is to receive information through different channels of production and data communication. And another, uh, and it's a different thing to create me metadata and create links between the information and generate new data. And this idea of metadata, which has appeared recently on literature relating to espionage and cross data analysis by market researchers or governments to build consumer profiles. So, so you're crossing the information you provide when you use a bank card or when you buy a car or when you when you enter a computer program. So all this creates a profile of a consumer where and, and with regards to this, we generate daily um, uh, advertisements that are targeted at, directly at us. And also, often, it's a source of frauds as well. There's a passage, well, sorry, there's a, a leap from information to knowledge that can be, that, that can occur quantitatively through cross-reference metadata, but which is produced much more, with much more complexity when we see the offline-online relationship. Some researchers with whom I work say there is no such thing as online information. All online information is digested by the person through, through, through behaviors that are not digital but are born from other technologies and other for sources of knowledge. And this is where anthropologists really insist on the fact that although today we speak on of society of knowledge and society of, of learning, well, all societies have at every moment been a society of knowledge. We've always had certain knowledges in a certain context and relating to a historical context as well. And this acceleration, because every society has a culture and knowledge, was served up until to the 20th century to question the European superiority and to speak of other forms of creating knowledge in Africa, Asia, or Latin America, or in marginal groups of people in the first world or the developed world. But today, the question is, is it possible for a society to be self-sufficient? Up until the mid-20th century, most of the products we 
used were produced inside the countries. The cars were produced inside your country. Bread was produced inside the country. Clothing. No. Today, most of what we consume is produced in other countries, maybe El Salvador, Indonesia, or we have to look at the label of our shirt to know if if this is true. Uh, well, we need to know where, to know where it comes from, and even then, we can't be sh true. We can't be sure. Sorry. When this globalization process, this decentralized globalization process began, in this process. The traditional locations, well, for instance, Philips was born in the Netherlands, but it does not produce in the Netherlands. So a conferencist asked all the attendants to remove their, 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 their jacket and look at the, at the label and gave them scissors and said, can you tell me where can you bring me your 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 labels and she created a flag of labels on the blackboard and it became evident that in a certain city or in a place like this we have a multiplicity of origins and this origin of objects tends to be standardized, and that's what blurs the local origin. However, they often have very specific relations to local culture. For instance, there are anthropological studies on maquiladoras in the north of Mexico, Asia, Guatemala, that compare a company, the maquiladoras of production unit, Let's say uh, we have Ford, which has factories all over the world, or Hermenegil Losena or Massimo Dutti that have factories throughout the world. How production, although it is designed centrally, it interacts as a title of a book by Luis Regadas. We have it brings together, it, it, it creates an ensemble of cultures. So we don't have the same labor laws, we don't have the same design in metropolitan, in, in, in companies of a developed world that have sent their factories to Mexico, Brazil, and other developing countries. So there is an intercultural interaction between the different ways in which you can organize to to, to organize your hours of the day and relate, say, food with family time, which are often taken into advantage by the large companies that, and which aim to articulate new labor forms, new consumption habits, but also of new forms of accessing knowledge. Because if our point of the departure is this, that all societies are societies of knowledge that know how to produce according to their needs, and all these needs can be considered legitimate, we will discover an, a rich articulation and we see this in many of our activities. Let's say sometimes we combine traditional and allopathic medicine, usually Asian traditional medicine. We, we are transforming in our bodies different types of knowledge and assimilating them. But what I wanted to, to ask myself is what is the limit of this knowledge. These different objects of design, these different social relationships and relationships with other forms of knowledge that occur in the software and the hardware 
software the brain, hardware the physical hard infrastructure, which changes according to a new global order, but also notwithstanding how stereotyped it may seem with local forms of knowledge developed very locally. So I'd like to just say something about the research that we conducted with young people. They are, in principle, those most open to these transformations, to these uh, to adapt with the speed that technology demands, and this is why they are more um, open to changing their habits. And we were focusing on creative young people. Creativity has become a central ingredient in our societies and in our industrial technology and service production in the contemporary world. Companies. Uh, uh, as can be seen in the book, The New Spirit of Capitalism, they stimulate creativity and in their training manuals give a very uh, a large importance to fostering creativity. They don't want employees to simply repeat stereotypical tasks but for them to try and find ways and propose to a company ways of innovating and improving their tasks. And this has led to an overestimation of the role of creativity and innovation, which has grown. However, the other point that has led to a stimulation of creativity, not only within the companies, but also the at a decentralized level is the difficulty or how difficult it can be now to produce jobs for the entire population. I can't go into detail on of the impact of new, the new liberal economy and how this has led to an optimization of profits through hurting the labor conditions and through outsourcing and more flexible work hours and more flexible services and higher outside hiring through at a cheaper price this has led to a multi multiplied creativity where we have young unemployed people participating in in large numbers it's not it's, it's no coincidence that ever since the 80s and 90s outsourcing of production goes hand in hand with an incorporation of creativity into the new forms of work that are decentralized and self-managing because this relates with higher educational levels of new of young people which enables them to to use and to manage the machines for production but also for for them to incorporate in these flexible external conditions that are external and um, away sometimes and f distant from the financial and technological centers of the world. What did we find in this study we, we conducted in Mexico City and Madrid? Well, we discovered a few aspects that are very similar to what has been studied in the United Kingdom with research uh, into the creative work has been incentivized by the state. They have provided scholarships, subsidies, they have provided self-management, small companies, and there's a, an author, Angela McRobin, who has studied this in the United Kingdom in, in Spain, Gerald Rowan, and France, Pierre-Michel Manger, the, perhaps the greatest expert on creative work, which is the title of his main book. 
like them and perhaps with more emphasis on anthropology and ethnography because that's what we focused in on and not on economics. We did later study the economy of the creative class. We discovered certain discrepancies between how creati creativity is valued when seen from the hegemonic perspective or from the perspective of the creative workers, where governments saw more freedom for entrepreneurs because of their more f well freedom. We, we discovered anxiety and self-exploitation because they never know at, because there's a huge uncertainty of how long they're going to have a job for and when they're going to find a new job and where governments see an intensity and and a and, uh, great horizon for work. What people describe as new forms of gender discrimination, loss of labor rights, And as a result, the way in which we value information societies or knowledge societies or that want to create creative or cities of knowledge like Monterrey in Mexico said it would, would become or others like Cambridge, Oxford, Boston, Bilbao, after the introduction of the Guggenheim Museum. The creative economy has helped these cities overcome the decadence of the loss of industrial jobs. But what is the feasibility of this type of model in Latin America? It's no it's not by chance that Monterrey, that's possibly the most powerful city in Latin America from a metalworking perspective, and that saw its production drop and all the different factories, such as glass, uh, come apart. And they, they are now museums because that is now uh, imported, especially after the NAFTA agreement with the U.S. and Canada, well, th that they've tried to have a reconfiguration of the city with the Universal Forum of Cities, an idea that they purchased from Barcelona in 2004. They applied it here in Monterrey. And all this has failed for many reasons. One of the main reasons is that contextual increases in violence have led to so many difficulties for a creative economy. For instance, people would no longer go out at night and people ate in restaurants less. They would not attend cultural uh, events. And many scientific and technological and creative co cooperation projects failed and went bankrupt. But they, they had developed them with many European and Southern and universities of the Southern United States. They had large academic exchange programs, but once a few students were murdered, those professors and students returned to the U.S. and this these forms of collaboration went dry. So we cannot idealize these phenomena, that this phenomena of technology and simply think that they are going to result in new cities and new technological cities if we do not think of other contexts of benefits for the population that make it possible for people to go out at night and to consume these technologies and to innovate in other ways. And another point of the different discoveries that we that we were able to find working with these kids is that it changes the way in which we conceive personal life. We have already seen that in 2015. 
Well, actually, 2005, when the National Youth Survey was carried out, I worked at it with a group of uh, specialists on, uh, on the youth in Mexico. And we found that besides the survey, that had a lot of personal questions, as, as is the case with most youth surveys, we gave them a list of phrases to find out uh, where, which one they connected the most with. Out of this, 44,000 young people that were interviewed in Mexico, and the most, and the phrase that was uh, selected the most, read, "Future is so the future is so uncertain that it is better to live on a day-to-day -day basis." And this uh, phrase was translated, well, actually translated to very specific knowledge. And this will be my final point: the the pro, the transition. But there's uh, people we work with in Mexico, and let me find out if I can show you some images. This was the economic survey. I had no time to develop what we did with Ernesto Piedras. And there we uh, saw results of the creative economy, as well as the participation of young people, the precariousness of employment, the fact, for instance, that for, for the universe of this uh, young population, more than 170 surveys were carried out, as well as uh, well, the sources of income that they uh, obtained for, uh, for sustenance in their creative activity was, um, was just a fraction, whereas the rest of it had to be supplied by their parents or other people. This is how. Uh, this shows how this um, people co-work. Yeah, that is very important because it is not only individual creativity and technology is highly significant and important. However, there are also festivals, methods of um, cooperation, visual incubators, as these are called, bazaars are organized, as well as different uh, ways to uh, have their products uh, move around. But one of the features I would like to highlight is that the idea of a career that many of us had, especially those of, those of us that have more than 45 or 50 years, well, if we, we, we thought that if we did good at universities and if we fulfilled a set of requirements and if we developed a, a consistent, uh, a consistent uh, career, we could become managers at a company or be successful at a specific economic activity or become congressperson or something worse than that. And that career idea, the linearity of a biographical development was lost. And the, what we can see in these young people is a constant uh, transition to other to other means and uh, different, different uses of their skills in such a way that, for example, uh, an art graduate can work as a photographer for six months, then be unemployed for three months, then uh, get a job as um, as a set designer at a at a at a film studio, then spend six months without a job, at, and at all times without social security or medical services. Such precariousness, and let me highlight this word precariousness, becomes a a structural feature in the life of new generations, because in other creative, uh, that is also the case with other. Uh, other creative, uh, other creative um, professions, such as, uh, for example, culinary studies and so on, and they've become part of this uh, new shift in current uh, creative, creative activities. It founds the uh, problems. It founds a lot of finds a lot of issues in developing. It is not just. Uh, receiving information and uh, learning in such a way that we can learn to use new devices. It is how we frame this within a relationship of knowledge with the world and uh, a much more unstable and precarious organization in our lives. Thank you very much.